Hello and welcome to Court Games, a podcast for the Legend of the Five Rings community, funded by the Legend of the Five Rings Discord Patreon. This podcast will focus on the role-playing game stories and lore for Legend of the Five Rings. I'm Kova. I'm Kikita Kaori, and today we're going to talk about grappling and status effects and how those fit mechanically in combat for Legend of the Five Rings 5th edition. Yes, grappling rules are almost always the most complicated part of pretty much every role-playing game I've ever played, except the ones that don't have grappling rules because they're always so too, too complicated. Pretty much. <laughs> so we're going to be going through how they work and some ideas, some homebrew ideas for hopefully improving them. But first we have some news. We have the Great Clans of Rockagand 2 out now in book, ebook, and audiobook format. And that has a new lion novella by Robert Denton called Death Seeker. And that comes with the previous Crab and Dragon novellas, Trial of Shadows by D.G. Ladderoot and The Eternal Knot by Mary Brennan. So if you have not already got all the novellas, and if you want to get the the new Lion one, uh, that's now out and available. <laughs> In addition, we have some future no- novels coming out from Aconite. Uh, we do have The Flowered Path uh, coming out by Josh Reynolds, a new Daijoji Shin mystery that I believe is coming out in June. Um, in November of 2022, The Heart of Ichiban by Evan Dickin is coming out. And the blurb for that is, set in the world of Legend of the Five Rings, Adventures in Rokugan RPG, this fantasy adventure pits noble samurai from each of the seven great clans against a forgotten evil corrupting the whole realm. So. Yeah. Be interesting to see how that pans out. And lastly, there is a secret book out for October 2022. So I guess don't tell anyone about that or something. <laughs> we, don't, we don't know what that is. Uh, no. Uh, and, like, we really don't know. This is not – we don't know. Nod, nudge, nudge, wink, wink. No, we, don't, we, really, we really don't know. But uh, I, as soon as we know more, we will tell you. <laughs> All right. So that's our news. Uh, we do have – you know, Breath of the Wild will come out at some point when it comes out, and, and we'll keep hanging on and we'll let you know when we get it. Bits of, bits of it have been seen. Mm-hmm. But today we're going to talk about status effects. And this is as it exists until it's all overruled because breath, you know, uh, the, the rich of the wild has new rules for it. But, you know, we have to deal with life as it is. Status effects are difficult to deal with in 5th in edition. And that makes grappling or similar hand-to-hand combat difficult. So we've got some homebrew thoughts, some things to help you talk about it. And we'll talk about the different inflicted status effects. Uh, Just as an example of how complicated status effects would be. Uh, In the advantages and disadvantages sections of the core rulebook, in the flexibility advantage, it says that To grapple, you do a martial arts unarmed water check. In the lost arm disadvantaged, to grapple, you do a martial arts unarmed fire check. And in the Shadowlands Taint Earth section, it says, to grapple, you do a martial arts unarmed earth check. But nowhere in the whole book or any of the follow-up books does it say what happens when you have grappled somebody. Yeah. Or how you keep grappling someone. Or anything else about grappling. It just tells you you can grapple them with each of these various rings, but but nothing after that. So we got to fix that a little bit. Additionally, there are these five status effects that you can inflict on another person. And this isn't bleeding. This isn't bleeding or things like that. Yeah, with the, with the exception of bleeding, which we know about because that's sharp pointy objects. And there are rules for this. But there's dazed, disoriented, immobilized, prone, and silenced. So each of these have similarities. They're generally inflicted by an opportunity value on a roll using a 
technique, a specific technique or a weapon. They're generally removed if the target suffering the status effect does not take a certain action type by the end of their turn, which we'll get into with with each individual one. Generally prevents the target from taking an action type or their target number is higher if they do take that action type. And there are also techniques that take special advantage of a target suffering that status effect to do either additional damage or some kind of secondary effect. So that they all have that kind of format. However, they're scattered all the way through all the books. So we've kind of we're going to talk about each one individually and then try to, you know, we'll we'll sum it up, but you know, this is kind of gathering it in one place cuz it's all over the place. The dazed status effect is generally associated with fire spells, kiho, kata, and shuji, um, and basically means that they have been, you know, bonked on the head or, or otherwise, you know, so startled that they cannot uh, function correctly for sure. Overwhelmed, time. yeah. Yes. Um, dazed interrupts channeling for spells. Many of these do not. Um they the effect of dazed is to increase the target number of attack or scheme actions by two. And it is removed when the target does not perform an attack or scheme action uh, before the end of the turn. So if they go a turn without doing an attack or scheme action, which they is harder for them to do anyway, it goes away. And that overall is a big problem with the status effects is that they go away very, very quickly um, at the end of your opponent's turn. So the resist for most kind of things that inflict dazed is higher, plus one to resist air and minus two to resist water. But for all of the resists, for all of these uh, effects, they can either come as a target number three, target number four, target number five, depending on the technique used to initially inflict the condition. So if it's inflicted by a rank five, then it might have a target number five, six air, uh, minus two water, for example, in this one. And it's resisted, what it's resisted by, can I think, can that change with techniques in that? Overall, what it is resisted by for dazed is better, you know, well, all rings can resist everything. However, the target number is higher with air and lower with water for dazed in general. So what, what kind of things inflict dazed? It's an opportunity use on a number of school techniques, uh, Kikita rank six, Atoma rank six and rank one, Sheikah Spear Dancer, Fire Kiho often do it, Fire Incantations often do it, Maho and Poison, kind of different kinds can inflict dazed, what's yours is mine, Ninjutsu can, and the Harvester title is really good if you want to get into um, inflicting status effects on everything because it inflicts every kind of thing, including dazed. In terms of Kata that inflict dazed... The Disappearing World style, Flashing Steel Strike, and Iejutsu Sword and Sheath kata all can inflict dazed. And the Lord Dakota's Roar can inflict dazed. And it's an opportunity on the Fanning the Flames Shuji. So those are the ways you can do dazed with techniques of different kinds. Spinning Blade Strike increases its damage on a target that is dazed, and so does Thunderous Blows style. So they kind of take advantage of it. So if you were going to try and maximize your use of dazed, you would have something that inflicts it and something that takes advantage of it. Overall, frankly, dazed is the most generally useful status effect. It is the most easy to exploit, Uh, An increase of TN to attack or scheme actions of two is effectively stopping them from doing anything against you in combat for a turn until they remove the dazed. This is more useful than stopping them from moving in combat or doing any number of other things because 
in a general skirmish action economy, you want to be attacking them more times than they attack you. That's why, and if they can't hit you, they aren't effectively attacking you. And plus two is quite a lot when it comes to target number. Plus a lot of things handed out. And the biggest, I think, a thing is just that fire is really powerful to begin with because of all the bonus successes in impacting it. So finally, monks with a, very, a, a couple of the fire kiho can turn fire kiho into chained dazes, which uh, prevents the opponent from fighting. Uh, it just, you know, days after days after days uh, using... Days for days. Right. And that's not a good situation to be on the other side of. It's fun for the player, but it might not be fun to be the target of. Yes. Yeah. I think a lot of these things that kind of, yeah, it's great when the player gets to do it, but if the player gets to do it, they're not going to like it done, being done to them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're picking out a status, if you want to play a status effect inflicting person, days is, is the easiest one, but there's other ones. Yep. So next we're going to look at Disoriented. That's associated with spells, Kiho, Kata, and Shuji of air. What it does is it increases the target number of movement or support actions by two. It can be inflicted if you fall from any height, which includes height zero, unless you resist it with a target number three fitness check, only that's target number one with air and target number five with earth. And if you fail certain checks, that can also inflict disoriented, for example, heart piercing strike. And it is removed when they do not perform a movement or support action. So again, it's the same thing that gives them the penalty. If they just don't do it, then they can lose it. Resistance is plus one when resisting with earth or minus two when resisting with fire. Only not when you're falling from the sky, apparently. Yeah, well. Some school techniques inflict it. So there's the rank six Bayushi manipulator, the Kakita Otomo and Komarist shield bearer all have rank six um, techniques that inflict it. There are air kiho, air incantations, maho again, and poison again. The harvester title and moon cult rituals. For Kata, you've got the breath of wind style and... In order to take advantage of it, you can use the Veiled Menace style, which inflicts a critical hit. So given that movement and support actions are generally best at assisting and helping and working for non-combatants, it's generally good for if you don't want the opponent to escape a scene. Uh, it can also prevent an Iojutsu strike as well. Right, because that's a movement. Mm. So maybe not quite as useful as Dazed, but same zone uh it's interesting it's one you inflict on, on yourself from time to time yes um it, it's not directly useful for combat stuff but stopping someone from escaping can be very important depending on exactly why you're fighting people mm -hmm. immobilized is uh associated with both water and earth spells um kiho kata and shuji and a target that is immobilized is unable to perform movement actions or select a different stance during combat or reposition themselves. They can attack, however. Immobilized can be inflicted by snaring weapons at a cost of one opportunity per point of the target's vigilance, which usually means at least two or three yeah. opportunities because vigilance doesn't go below to really well very rarely <laughs> unless they're compromised yes if you compromise that's when you're it's it's really quite dangerous yeah mm -hmm. it can be removed if the target does not do a movement action resisting it uh, like everything else it varies on how to resist it but it's generally Harder to resist it in water stance, plus one TN to resist it in water. And it's easier to resist it in air stance, minus two TN for that. It's inflicted by the rank six Shiba Guardian technique, by certain earth and water kiho and certain earth and water incantations. Again, like the um, other techniques, maho and poison and the harvester title can do it. Also, the silent elimination and employ terrible thunder 
ninjutsu can immobilize your your target. In terms of the kata that inflict it, uh, Lord Hida's grip, coiling serpent style, and landslide strike uh, can inflict it. And it is a favored thing for the badger. The fierce badger style and the Ichiro grappler school can both take advantage of this status when it's been inflicted. Immobilized can be effective for critical strike focused fighters trying to keep an opponent out of earth stance. The most useful unarmed technique is the open palm strike, which forces your opponent into a different stance, uh, as does landside strike. Uh, if you can shove somebody off of earth stance and keep them off, you can then make them vulnerable to critical strikes. It also works well when fighting a Shigenja or monk that specs heavily into a single ring. So if they are a high, I'm going to stack up high on my fire because I'm a dazed style fighter, this could keep them out of dazed stance, potentially. But it's easy to break out of, and we'll talk about uh, how to address that in our homebrew. Prone is associated with Kiho, Kata, and Shuji of Earth, generally, so Earth spells Kiho, Kata, and Shuji. If you're prone, you can only move a maximum of one range band during your turn. You're also harder to hit with ranged attacks. If you fall from any height of range two or higher on a failed save, you are prone. And there can be consequences of failing certain checks, like a heart-piercing strike. Similar to immobilized in a way, it's removed when they don't perform a movement action. Uh, resist is plus one to resist, very, but it varies by technique. Yeah, for my homebrew, I would use, uh, to make it kind of balanced with the others, I would make it harder to resist, plus one to resist the fire, and easier to resist with earth. Minus two resist with earth. That's what I do as a generic thing. But each technique has a different resist for this particular status effect. For, for ex extra confusion. School techniques that inflict it, uh, you've got Ivory Kingdom Sage and Ichiro Grappler. There are Earth Kiho that do it, uh, Earth Incantations, um, the now familiar Maho Poison and Harvester title. The Silence Elimination and Employ Terrible Thunder Ninjutsu also render people prone. For Kata, you've got Iron in the Mountain Style, Lord Heater's Grip, Trip the Leg, Slicing Wind Kick, Laughing Fox Style, Landslide Strike, Reckless Lunge, and Whirling Sweep. And to take advantage of it, you would use Rushing Avalanche Style. So it doesn't really do that much, because effectively everyone has a range band of movement for free, and that just means I can't do any more than that, which is um, not super exciting <laughs> and, and and it gives the benefit of being get, uh, being slightly harder to hit at range so it's almost more a positive than in that than it is a negative mm -hmm. unless you're trying to make sure that they only crawl away slowly yes the last of the status effects is a little little different in that silenced is only created under special conditions. However, it, like Dazed, does interrupt channeling for spells, which is actually pretty important, you know, from time to time. If you see the Shigenja piling up for a big spell, you know, you want to stop them. Dazed works better, you know, but, you know, this works too. It increases the TN of Shuji checks and activating invocations, Maho and Shuji, by three. So you can still do them, but it increases the TM by three, which is quite a lot. It is inflicted by some spells. Silencing Stroke Ninjutsu. I believe the Caillou Warden does it too. And it is removed when the target does not perform a scheme action or any check requiring speech for the turn. I'm curious as to whether that fact that if you are silenced... Shuji invocations Maho in going up by attack number three, if that's referenced anywhere else. Like, because someone says, can I cast this spell silently? Well, apparently the answer is yes, but your target number goes up by three. <laughs> I mean, you could, you could make that inference. Mm -hmm. 
And I don't know if that's referenced anywhere else. In any of it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So those are the different status effects. Yeah. So as presented, there are some problems. So the fire ring already pretty much dominates combat because of the strength of bonus successes and how much it helps endurance. So if, if, you're, if you're heavily into fire, then you've got a good endurance, which is great for combat, plus you're getting all these bonus successes. The fire-associated special condition, dazed, is the strongest of these movement-inflicted conditions because it, it can disrupt spell casting, has good techniques to let you kind of chain it and keep them dazed, and take advantage of them being dazed. Dazed also really messes with their combat economy and indeed their, their intrigue economy, honestly, as well because they can't do things that directly affect the combat or the injury, at least not without, you know, a plus two target number. So it's a bit unbalanced because dazed is just so good because fire is so good. So, you know, fire is already good and then dazed is even better. And then, so that just makes fire even better. <laughs> the main problem with all of them is that there aren't really any rules outside of Carter and Techniques. There aren't any rules for inflicting this. So if you don't have a dazed technique, there is no way to even try and daze someone. If you don't have a silencing technique or shuji or invocation, you can't silence someone and so on and so on and so on. And there also aren't rules outside of a kata or technique to resist them or avoid them. So there are, if you, unless you have specific kata and specific techniques, there isn't a specific way of resisting these things although or there's no isn't a way of becoming better at resisting them and they automatically go away assuming your opponent avoids the thing that is now too difficult for them to even try right <laughs> so they almost always go away immediately and i've you know i'm i'm not saying i'm a grappling expert like i've watched some ufc and it seems to me that grappling doesn't quite work that way, <laughs> you know? So I've tried to make some homebrew about this. And, uh, you know, so I want to grapple an opponent. I don't have anything associated with grappling. I just want to grapple them for, for whatever reason. So this section is all homebrew, all right? Homebrew warning. Homebrew warning. Alert, try alert. And make it available uh, on the Court Games website or on uh, Winter Garden of the Kikita, but this this is homebrew, homebrew stuff. So for my homebrew, instead of taking an action like strike in combat, you can choose to take an action specifically to inflict one of the above status effects. So for this, we'll call it an inflicting action because you're inflicting a status effect on your opponent. Okay? For balance reasons and other stuff... I'm going to say you can't do an inflicting action without at least one hand free. That means if you're carrying a weapon, it must be in a one-handed grip. And you can't be wielding two weapons because it's really hard to immobilize somebody while carrying a sword in each hand as well. You know, you, 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 need, you need a hand free to do the thing, right? Um, when you want to do a status effect, you need to, as a player, provide an explanation for how you're producing the effect to the GM. Like, I'm going to run up and tackle him, or I'm going to throw dirt in his face. We'll give examples for how this will work for each of these status effects uh, when we talk about the specific status effects. The TN for an inflicting action is the same as the TM for a normal strike attack action. So this would be a normal TN2, or TN3, if you're fighting against somebody who's in air stance, with any other modifiers that you would have to strike somebody, okay? If the strike, if the inflicting action roll is successful, the target of the inflicting action may take a fitness roll to prevent the condition, with the specific TN being dependent on what the condition is in the stance. Similar to as we talked about with the previous stances, some are going to be lower and some are in higher, depending on what the condition is. All right. 
that role in general is going to have a TN of, in general, of two to, 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 to do it. But every two bonus successes on the original roll to afflict increases the TN to prevent the condition by one. So let's say I am going to grapple you. I'm going to try and inflict the immobilized condition on you. You get to roll a fitness roll TN2 to escape it. But I got two bonus successes on my initial grapple roll. So now you have to hit bonus a TN of three. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can make it harder for them to escape with a more successful initial roll. Inflicting actions when you when you are not using a technique to inflict a condition, it causes no fatigue and it cannot create critical strikes or any any effects like that, okay? You can use opportunities for other things, but you can't do critical strikes off of a inflicting action and it doesn't actually cause fatigue to them. Mm-hmm. Some conditions can be sustained and we'll talk about sustained and some conditions cannot be sustained. So we'll talk about that next. So sustained, if the, the, if it's, if a condition can be sustained, then it can be carried over from one turn to the next without the person doing the inflicting action to reroll the, to inflict the condition. The person who did the original inflicting action cannot take attack actions or movement actions while sustaining the condition, but they can change stance. The target of the condition may make the same fitness roll against the inflicting action that they made when they were targeted by that effect every turn that the condition is sustained. If the condition is sustained, the target of the condition cannot break free of it simply by not taking the act action for all the round, but instead they have to actively resist. Right. So that means they can do the other things necessary, um, you know, that they're allowed to do. Like if they're allowed to make attack actions while um, immobilized, they can still take attack actions. Um, But immobilized won't go away if they don't take a movement action. They have to break the fitness check. To specifically get so basically they can they can wander around the, the battlefield as much as they like with this guy kind of hanging off them, slowing them down. <laughs> well, they can't wander. <laughs> They're immobilized. Yeah, but but simply not trying to take a, a movement action doesn't stop it. They've actually got to get this person off them. Yeah. Right. So here's an, the first example we'll talk about is dazed. And dazed is going to be a little weaker than some of the other ones to counteract some of its other benefits. If you want to inflict dazed, you can only do it from range one. If you try to do a attempt to daze at range zero, it will end up rain, uh, dazing both the target and the attacker. Because... When you are dazing someone, you are basically using a consumable item to attack. This could be a light flashing in their eyes. It could be uh, thrusting a torch in their face. You could be throwing dirt in their face um, a, you know, or some other consumable item that you are attacking with to um, cause them to be dazed. So, you know, if I throw the embers of a fire into your face, you might be dazed. That's fair. Using that item consumes it. So it's not something you can keep doing on the field because you're using a consumable item and it's and it's gone after you've dazed them with it. Okay. The attack for dazed is a TN2 martial arts unarmed attack fire. Okay. And it's considered to be attacking with an improvised weapon, which uses unarmed And similar to others, if the target is in air stance, it would be TN3. Dazed cannot be sustained using the sustained rules. Uh, It can be resisted with a TN2 fitness check, uh, TN3 air, or TN1 water. You know, minus two to resist with water with a minimum of one. And that TN2 fitness check is modified by plus one for every two bonus successes on the initial attack. But the important thing is that dazed can't be sustained. And you can't keep repeating doing it because it uses a consumable item. Yep. So inflicting disoriented without a specific technique, there'll be range zero 
or range two in obscuring terrain, but not range one. So there's two ways of doing it. For the first one, range zero, a target number two martial arts unarmed air attack, which would modify to target number three if they're, they are in air stance. So you're tripping someone, you're knocking them over, otherwise calling to, causing them to fall or be thrown, that kind of thing. The other option is a target number two, again, modified if they're in air stance. So target number two martial arts ranged air attack using the environment or a ranged attack improvised weapon to make the target confused as to where they're being attacked from. So flinging pebbles at the target, calling from many directions, uh, using ventriloquism and throwing stuff off into the bushes so it sounds like you're coming from there, that sort of thing. Disoriented can't be sustained and the effect can be resisted with a target number two fitness check plus one to resist with earth, minus two to resist with fire, with a minimum of one, and that's modified by plus one for every two bonus successes on the initiating attack. The key thing here is that it just, it can't, it can be done at range zero or range two if it's in obscuring terrain, but it can't be done like normal sword range. You, 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 if you're facing, because at that point they can see you, you can see them. There's nothing funky going on. You're not using the environment or anything like that to to confuse them. That everybody can see each other. All right, inflicting immobilized. This is the one that we tend to think of when we're talking about snaring or grappling. So, immobilized can occur at range zero, or it can occur at a weapon range for a snaring weapon. So, if you have a range, uh, if you have a snaring weapon, whatever that snaring weapon is, it can occur at whatever range that snaring weapon allows, okay? So the attack is either a grapple, a direct grapple when you're inflicting immobilized, or it is an attack with a snaring weapon. So if it is a grapple, it is a TN2 martial arts unarmed water attack, modified against TN3 for air, like, and it's a grapple, tackle, grab, wrestle, otherwise hang on to your target, okay? If it is with a snaring weapon, it is a TN2 martial arts melee check, water, with with your snaring weapon. So that would be entangling with the snaring weapon being the primary form of the attack. So normally with a snaring weapon, you can do a hit and then use opportunities to make a snaring attack. And if you do that, it does damage and it does snaring. In this case, you're saying, I'm not going to do the damage. I'm just going to do the snaring. That's my goal of this attack. And I'm going to make that the primary use of my snaring weapon. And therefore, it does no damage. It does no fatigue. Can't do critical strikes. Nothing like that. But you're inflicting immobilized as on a successful attack. Now, immobilized can be sustained. So once the condition is set, then the attacker must choose to stop sustaining the attack by taking another attack action or some other action, right? Or the target must break the effect before the condition can be removed by succeeding on their fitness roll. Okay? The immobilized effect can be resisted with a TN2 fitness check with a plus one to resist water, minus two to resist air, minimum of one, again, modified by plus one for every two bonus successes on the attack. So you're grappling them, you hang on to them, now you are sustaining. The next round, you can't make any more attack actions because you're busy sustaining, but you don't have to roll to, to hit sustain. But if you're sustaining it, they have to make the fitness check to break free or they will continue to be immobilized. So they can hit you, you can't hit them while you're holding them immobilized. But, you know, they can't leave their stance, they can't do some other things. So next we're gonna move on to prone. That's either at range zero, or you could use a cumbersome weapon at your weapon range. And this attack is knocking an opponent down, either unarmed or with a cumbersome weapon, so a big weapon, Tetsubo type thing. So the unarmed version is target number two, martial arts, unarmed earth, 
modified, obviously, with tag number three, air. So you're pushing, you're shoving, you're doing a knockdown. The other option is tag number two, martial arts, melee, earth attack, with a cumbersome weapon. And that's you knocking them down as the primary mode of attack. So again, it doesn't do any fatigue damage if you do this that way. You just knock them down with your Tetsubo. (laughs) Prone can be sustained. Once the condition is set, the attacker must either stop sustaining or the target must break the effect before the condition can be removed. By sustaining prone, you're, you're basically putting a foot on their back and keeping them on the ground. Yeah, or you're kind of shoving them down with the tetsubo and then leaning on it and that kind of thing. Yeah. The effect can be resisted with a tag number two fitness check, and that is plus one if you're resisting with fire, minus two if you're resisting with earth to a minimum of one, and that's modified by plus one for every two bonus successes on the attack roll. So that gives a use to some of those cumbersome right, uh, weapons, which people tend to shy away with. And that's the those are the ones that tend to inflict prone on the opportunities anyway. So it just just a little boost for cumbersome weapons because they've got enough problems with them anyway. The last status effect is silenced. And silenced is a little different. Uh, it can either be done at range zero uh, which is physically silencing, um, like putting a hand over their mouth or punching them in the face or otherwise <laughs> forcing them to be silenced in that fashion. To silence someone physically, the target must already be at range zero and immobilized. So you have to somehow have gotten them, you know, have them in your grip to put put a hand over their mouth, all right? This is a TN2 martial arts unarmed void attack, uh, modified TN3 air, and it's muffling or gagging or covering their mouth. Um, The effect can be resisted with a TN2 fitness check. Uh, Plus one resist fire, minus one resist void with a minimum of one, modified by plus one for every two bonus successes on the attack. Um, Silenced when physically inflicted can be sustained. Once the condition is set, the attacker must stop sustaining it or the target must break the effect free before the condition can be removed. Now, as an option, GM can say, okay, I want to silence somebody, but they're not already immobilized. I'll let you do it by punching them in the mouth, in which case they're silenced, but that can't be sustained. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? They have to be immobilized before they can do a silence, physical silence that can be sustained. But there's a good argument to be made that they can silence somebody if they're not immobilized in a way that can't be sustained because you've just punched them in the face, which is rude. But, yeah. (laughs) An alternative to silenced. And this is the only one that's not a a physical uh, action there is that you can choose to do silence as a scheme action, okay? So this is basically yelling at somebody in such a way as to startle them to shut up. You've interrupted them by shouting at them, okay? So this is a command check. Uh, It cannot be done quietly. You are shouting at them in their face. It is a command void scheme action with a target number of the target's vigilance. So you're ordering them to stop yelling shut up or otherwise drowning them out by shouting. It can be resisted with a a TN2 meditation check. Minus plus one resist fire, minus two resist void, modified by one for every two bonus successes on the attack. Silenced when inflicted by a scheme action cannot be sustained. So... This should be used carefully. It's up to the GM if they want this. But this is a way to stop someone channeling basically by startling them. So uh, if you have somebody who's using channeling a lot, you should be careful with it. If you don't want them to shout to interrupt a, a, a spell again, you can make them have higher vigilance. That's why this uses vigilance rather than um, TN2. And uh you know, potentially can go even even higher than that. But uh, it's it's just an alternative for inflicting that silence condition because sometimes you get startled into silence. So that's what <laughs> that, that, that is. So that's our homebrew. Um, 
as I said, we'll try and put it out there for for you to use, but at least it gives your players some way outside of techniques to uh, use these things and then combine them with the techniques so that they can work together to maybe make combat a little bit less I damage you, you damage me, and, and start using some of these things, give you an idea of what grapple might be or... Uh, some of these other, I throw sand in his face or other kinds of crazy things your players might do to get an advantage. Um, have some rules around it. Yeah, yeah. Lots of different options. Uh, obviously, we'd love if, if you are able to look through those and give us some feedback, that'd be great. Because obviously all these things need me playtesting and uh, other people's eyes on it and all that kind of good stuff. So we would love to hear what people's opinions are on it. Right, so that's us for this week. And we'd like to give out a shout-out to our sister podcast, Fortune and Strife, which is our affiliated actual play podcast. They're still at the moment on hiatus, but they should be coming back fairly soon, is my understanding. I hope so. Mm, fingers crossed. And obviously we need to shout-out our friends at D20 Radio, who host a huge amount of role-playing game podcasts. So there's something for everybody at D20 Radio. Our content is funded by the Community Discord Patreon, which supports our editing costs, as well as our website, where you can store and see longer-term information, summaries of our podcasts, different RPG tools, these homebrew rules, and more. (laughs) For our... Patreons, we try to have special bonus content like Adventure Seeds, uh, early access to our AP podcasts, whatever we whatever we think of. Uh, online, you can find us at our website at courtgamespod.com, on Twitter at twitter.com slash courtgamespod, and on Patreon at patreon.com slash courtgames. But that is it for us this week. This is Kikita Kaori. May the fortunes favor you. And I have been Korva, and until we meet again, keep your jade handy.